to start the video off, we're going to look at one of the more controversial stats, and in my opinion, one of the best ones as well, that being PFF's ratings. In a general sense, I think PFF grades are great for just about anyone, but I think they're particularly useful for offensive linemen and defensive backs because those positional groups are at their best when you don't notice them. So PFF can provide a clear look at them when they're performing well and you don't really notice it, or they can help to quantify just how poorly they are playing. Pro Football Focus grades plays on a scale from negative 2 to a positive 2. So to put that into context, it's based on what should happen on said play. So a negative 2 would be missing an open receiver and throwing to a covered one, and the pass should be intercepted. Inversely, a positive 2 would be if you escape a bad pocket and throw a catchable ball deep downfield to a receiver. Now notice, I didn't say that the passes are intercepted or caught. And that's a key distinction between this stat and other stats, is it looks at the process more than it does the result. So whereas yards and just about any stat would hold it against a quarterback if a wide receiver drops the ball, PFF only looks at what you did on that given play. And I think that's the best strength of this stat. Another positive I like is that they throw away plays that don't actually tell you much. Meaning, if there's a coverage bust, it doesn't hold it against either defender unless it's obvious which one messed up. And it also doesn't benefit a receiver who just so happens to be running a route that is uncovered. The biggest issue I have is that there exists some ambiguity in this stat meaning it's hard to truly define what a positive 1 play looks like compared to a positive 0.5 play. So that allows for some ambiguity in stats, but that's mitigated mostly by the fact that 1. Every play is reviewed, and 2. A 90 grade for a game is not the same as a 90 for a season meaning they give precedent to players that have shown themselves to be consistently good or bad throughout a season. The next stat we're going to go over is DVOA, which stands for Defensive Value Over Average. And though defense is in its name, it's not actually solely a defensive stat. It also has offensive component to it as well. The way DVOA works is it compares your success in all situations to the general success of teams against similar opponents in those same situations. In other words, it says you had a 4-yard gain on 1st and 10 against a team we deem to have a poor defense. So that would be your success on that situation. It then compares it to, well, other teams have gotten five yards on average in those same situations. So even though that play looked successful, it was actually less successful than is average against said defense. So the biggest positive about this stat is that it helps keep things relative with the situations, meaning... A 3-yard gain on 1st and 10 is not the same as a 3-yard gain on 4th and 2. So it helps conceptualize those better than just raw stats such as yards per average would tell you. An issue for this stat, though, is that it can be a bit hard to define how truly good or bad a team or facet of a team is. Another issue is that DVOA does not adjust for the play call any, so it'll always skew towards teams that pass more than they run because passing is typically more efficient of an offensive style than rushing is, but the situation matters a lot. If you have a defense that's been getting gashed, rushing can help make sense because it'll slow the game down and give your defense more time to breathe whereas passing will get the drive over quick.
quickly, meaning you'll either score a touchdown or be stopped quickly. The next stat we'll go over is quite similar to DVOA, aside from one major difference, and that stat is EPA, or expected points added. EPA is traditionally thought of as being a quarterback stat, but it is useful in helping you establish how good an offense or defense is as well. The big distinction between EPA and DVOA is that EPA makes no adjustment for the opponent and instead focuses solely on the down, distance to go, field position, how long is left in the game, and who has home field advantage. The main benefit then is that It doesn't try to assume how good or bad a defense is or offense and instead just looks at every situation there is that is similar to the one you find yourself in. And that is good because it paints the the broadest picture, but it is also a bit problematic because when you add together every situation, the end result is going to be against an average opponent. So if you're going against a far lesser or greater than average opponent, the numbers are going to be somewhat skewed. An example of that is the Eagles this year, who have had a very easy schedule to this point. They're going to look better on this stat than they probably should because there's no adjustment for the opponent based. And of course, if we're talking about quarterback stats, we have to talk about the OG one, and that being quarterback rating. It looks at completion percentage, average yards gained per attempt, and then also touchdown and interceptions per attempt. With all those stats put together, you get a very good look at the general play of a quarterback because it shows you if they're being efficient with their attempts or if they're turning the ball over too much or if they're not being asked to do difficult things, such as not passing in the red zone. The issue I have with it is that it's not very filtered. So if it's a tight game late, that's going to be treated the same as if you're down 17 late. So there can be some stat padding. And also, it rewards you based on wide receiver play as well. So like the raw stats I talked about before that punish you for your receiver not catching the ball. It does that, but it also rewards you if your receiver makes a big play off of a short pass, which isn't really conducive to good quarterback play. And lastly, quarterback rating can be skewed tremendously by touchdowns and interceptions, which touchdowns can be more opportunity driven than they are anything else meaning if you only pass twice in the red zone you're going to likely have less touchdowns than a quarterback who passed 10 times in the red zone and interceptions can be very lucky in that maybe you threw an interception because your receiver dropped the ball and then a defensive back caught it or maybe you don't throw an interception because you threw it directly to a defensive back but they didn't catch it With all of that said, and though I was harsh towards it, I do think it still is a good stat, but there are some real glaring issues with it as well. The final stat we'll go over is the easiest to explain, and it is pressures, which is hits, sacks, and hurries combined into one stat, with hurries being defined as the quarterback being forced to throw the ball earlier than intended due to pressure, or them being chased around or outside of the pocket. So the big advantage pressures have over sacks is that it helps paint a clearer picture as to what the pass rusher is doing in a game or set of games. Because the average PFF grade drops 16 points when a quarterback is pressured versus when they're kept clean. So pressures helps encapsulate that number into one metric. An additional benefit to pressures over sacks are that pressures are going to be more consistent year to year than sacks are. So an example would be Vic Beasley had 15 and a half sacks in one year, and then his next highest was eight 
in the rest of his career. The reason there can be a discrepancy like that with sacks are that there's going to be a level of luck to your pressures being converted into sacks. So if you have all of your pressures combined into one stat, then you're going to have a better picture of how much you're actually contributing. Whereas sacks are a portion of a stat and can then be a bit misleading as to how much you're actually pressuring the quarterback. So I hope the video was helpful to you in defining some of the stats that are used across the NFL and also how to implicate them. If I had one final take-home message, it would be to try to implement as many stats as you can because, as you could probably tell from the video, there's benefits and issues associated with any stat you use. So to get the clearest picture, you're probably going to want to merge as many of them as you possibly can. If you liked the video, then please like the video, comment if you have anything to say, and be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content like this.